want to do after um, after the MBA. Um, and and I think for me, I always have described myself as a technologist. I just love building products. I love being, being in technology. And even though I considered for a hot minute to cross over to the consulting side and, and join McKinsey, um, I decided not to join McKinsey and instead join Google. And uh, it was it was an interesting thing because Google had just started um, I, they hadn't just started, they had started like about a year plus, uh, they had started an office in India, in Bangalore. Mm. And, uh, I must say they had an immense foresight, the leaders who came from Google, who set up that office back in 2008. Um, it was one of the very few distributed offices that Google had, uh, mm. they really wanted to build products for mm. emerging markets, particularly in India. And they saw the mm. initial, um, you know, uh, the internet population sort of coming together. Mm -hmm. So, so I just decided to join Google as a, as a product manager. I think I was not even a senior product manager, just, just a starting point product manager. Um, so I joined them, uh, in 2008 and, uh, I started working on Google maps, uh, the second week I was, uh, at Google. And, uh, the reason why I worked on Google maps was because, um, I think there were, it, it was, it was more happenstance than, than like some sort of directed philosophy in my head. Uh, it was one of those projects that didn't didn't really have a product manager associated with it. So I was sort of assigned to it. Uh, and I didn't realize that I'll spend my next eight years building maps, right? Like that, that's just how sometimes things work out. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so over the course of the, of the next several years, I grew up in the company. I spent three years in India uh, from 2008 to 2011. And then 2011, I moved to the Bay Area. Uh, that's where I'm based right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I moved with Google. And I basically had the opportunity to work on larger and larger projects over my Google career um, and started with building maps in India and uh, Asia. And then from here, uh, when I moved here, I had a global remit to really build the best maps out there, uh, look, look at all the data and so on and so forth. So, so I did a bunch of that. Um, and the other thing that's worth highlighting is uh, I also had the opportunity to see how a product can grow from a few million users to a billion users. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time, uh, of course, I wasn't solely responsible for it. Absolutely not. But like you know, you kind of have a have a seat on the on the on the side, and you just sort of watch how adoption of products can happen. It's just mind blowing to see that level of scale. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I also acquired Waze. Uh, that was one mm -hmm. of the acquisitions that I did. Uh, I led that deal. Uh, it was interesting to see how a company had really solved the problem better than Google had, right? Uh, even though we started with Maps way way early. So, so that was an interesting conversation, interesting sort of discovery. And then, um, then from, from Google, I moved to Uber in end of 2015 after mm -hmm. having spent almost uh, seven and a half, eight years at Google. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, what drew me to Uber was the fact that here was another company that was changing consumer behavior at a very rapid pace. I was a user of the product myself and mm -hmm. it just blew me away. You know, like the, the canonical thing, at least in the US, the canonical thing that everybody says is never sit in a car with a stranger. Right. Okay. And here, here were millions of people all over the world sitting in cars with strangers. Right. And these were not even professional drivers or whatever. Right. So there was this sort of interesting kind of consumer behavior shift that was happening, which I really wanted to be a part of and learn. So I jumped into, into Uber and spent four years there. Um, okay. You know, the, the couple of, couple of quick points I'd mentioned one was um, I started with a team of 10 people in year mm -hmm. one was leading hundred people year two and 1100 people in year three. Oh. So I had a 10 X growth every time. And again, you know, I was just like getting picked because, because so many things were changing at, at, at Uber. Yeah. Uh, and at Uber, I really learned how to really scale organizationally mm -hmm. as, as an executive and as a product leader um, and uh, led the company through IPO as a CPO, um, you know, built out the platform and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, been, it's been quite an interesting journey over the last 12, 13 years in terms of like starting off as a PM and kind of seeing that scale. Uh, and happy to cover more as we as we go through it. Yeah, no, I, I think a, a lot of what you what you've spoken about are very very large things, and and I think each probably deserve its own sort of session. But I think before you you entered the product sort of realm, uh, you mentioned that for a brief moment you were you were considering being a consultant. Now that's yes. a very interesting thing because that's what a lot of people are still very confused about. And if you are sort of graduating from a really good uh, MBA college, you, you have these two options, yeah, like a large part of are, are these two options. So if you could sort of help us understand, like, what, how should one think about it? Like which one to pick? And, and it might not suit everyone. Uh, Absolutely. So you would have your own sort of 
reasons why you did it, but I think it will be good to understand how do you sort of think about this uh, dilemma. Yeah, no, this is this is a very very personal kind of decision that people make because you know these decisions have long range impact on your trajectory of what you want to do in your life mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So I'll just share with you how I thought about it, right? And and maybe that's instructive. Maybe it's not. I mean, that was just my personal journey. I, you know, first and foremost, I have massive regard for people who work at all these consulting firms because these these firms bring so much intellectual capital and mm-hmm. analytical rigor. And mm-hmm. they see patterns that sometimes, you know, when you're working in one company and mm-hmm. you're focused on a project, you don't really see the bigger patterns. And, and what, what the premier consulting firms and, and good consultants can do is kind of really help you connect the dots in ways which you yourself will never do because you don't have the insights, you don't have the time to think about it and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, those were some of the reasons, by the way, I was attracted to consulting in the first place, which is like, look, it's going to be very interesting for me to solve problems from one industry to another industry and, and you know, really work with like A-level people, the CXOs of the world and all that. Um, so, which I think is a, it's a great career. For me personally, where it came down to as I was digging into it, uh, as I made the decision, I think it basically came down to a practical consideration and a, a sort of an emotional consideration. The emotional consideration was was more about like, what do I really want to do in my life? Do I want to build products? Do I want to get scale? I'm a technologist. I just love being around engineers. I'm an engineer myself, you know, Mm -hmm. all that. And I just couldn't see myself on a day-to-day basis getting that fulfillment uh, in the consulting role, right? So that was the emotional connection. And then the practical consideration was consulting requires you to just be on the road, travel, and, you know, do all that. And I was, you know, a few years into my career. I was not at an early stage in my career. I had almost Mm -hmm. like, I think eight or nine years of experience before I got to MBA, right? So mm-hmm. at that point, you know, my wife and I, we were like, I, I don't, I don't want to do that, right? I want to like just be more focused on one problem and 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 kind of practically manage my life. So okay. those were the two considerations, and and that's how I kind of decided. Okay, no, well, I think that's a that's a good framework for a lot of decisions in life. Like, what do you really want to see yourself doing? What gives you happiness? What gives you fulfillment? I guess a lot of decisions boil down to just that, and it it's. If, if you think about it that way, it's actually really simple. That what gives you happiness, I, I want to do that. Yeah. So I think it's it's in one way, uh, sort of a simple yeah. thing about life. Well, one, one, one tip I would give to everyone, and this is something that's worked very well for me in life, uh, and I learned it a little bit later. So hopefully if you are earlier, please use this uh, and, and, and you'll be more successful. Uh, <clears throat> one of my mentors told me uh, a few years ago that whenever you're making a big decision, especially around which job you want to pick or which project you even want to take uh, within a job, just imagine what your calendar would look like on a day-to-day, right? Paint a picture, use your, whichever calendaring tool you use, you use Google Calendar, Outlook, but it doesn't matter. Just open that and actually put fake blocks on it in terms of, okay, this is how I think I will spend my time on day one, day two, day three, or like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. Just build that out. Of course, you'll be not very precise because you just don't know exactly what the job would entail, but at least you get that. And then just sleep over it for a couple of days, share it with your, you know, if you, if you have family, if you're a spouse or whatever, even if you have kids, share it with them and say, hey, does this make sense to you? Does this reflect of who I am and what my interests are? If you mm-hmm. do that exercise, you'll be amazed at what jumps out to you because ultimately you can have all these grand visions in life, but mm-hmm. practically speaking, you have to do your job on a daily basis. That's yeah. where the rubber hits the road, right? So I would advocate, uh, please, uh, you know, do that exercise for yourself. And you will get so much more uh, insight in terms of uh, how what really matters to you because you know that's where that's where you will lead. Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting idea that you do you you just build your calendar because that's going to define your day to day operation. And and would yes. you be happy going through that week week over week, not just like one week? Yep. So that's Absolutely. a powerful experiment that that can help you decide. Yeah, I think uh, so. So jumping, I think more deeper in your experiences at Google and Uber, if you were to sort of pick one uh, toughest challenge or, or the one you're really proud of uh, pulling off within either of these companies, what would that be? Yeah, you know, I think this is very contextual for the audience as well. I think one of the projects that I was most proud of was when we built maps for India, hmm. right? So, so you know, again, going back to 2008, when I first joined, uh, I remember um, a lot of my friends and family in, in Bangalore uh, were very skeptical mm-hmm. that we could ever build working maps for India, right? Mm-hmm. And they were skeptical in two ways. One was they didn't believe that a product like that should even exist because mm-hmm. what's the need really, right? 
house, you know, everyone knows like when you're traveling in India, you just roll down your car window or, you know, bike or whatever. And you just ask somebody, you know, yeah. Hey, how do, how do I go there? Yeah. And it's funny, like I actually did that a lot in Hyderabad when I was in ISB. I had been out of India for a while and I, I came back to India. I did that in, in Hyderabad. And every time when I ask somebody, everybody will just ask me to keep going straight. I'm <laughs> like, where do I go? Like, I can't keep going straight, right? Like, just yeah. so, 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 so I was, it was very counterintuitive to me, uh, but everyone just said, hey, you know, there's no need. Mm. And then the second thing was that even if people agreed, like, yeah, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Like, how are you going to do it? The houses are not numbered. The roads are all over the place. How would you ever get traffic and you know, all that stuff? So I think it was a super challenging problem, to be quite honest. And, and I think the way we did it, uh, me and a bunch of amazing engineers uh, at Google during that time, uh, we did it based on a combination of getting user input, right? So we had a product called MapMaker that was already launched by the time I joined, um, uh, joined Google. And MapMaker had started getting traction. It was like a Wikipedia for maps. So there were a lot of amazing users who were helping build the map of India because based on their local knowledge. So I think that was an incredible product. The team that set that up just really kind of set the gold standard of how you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the second is, you know, this is again, because there are a lot of product folks on the call. Mm -hmm. One of the things I have learned is there is no substitute for grunt work mm -hmm. daily, looking at user logs, looking at failed queries and really figuring out how to solve it. So mm -hmm. me and two of my engineers, what we used to do on a daily, I think it started off daily and then it became weekly. We used to look at the top 50 to 60 failed driving direction queries in India and then examine each query and see why it failed, right? Mm -hmm. Was it a data problem? Was it an algorithm problem? Did we not understand the name of the street? You know, what have you? And mm -hmm. as we started doing this, the best part about the engineers was they were, they were kind of system thinkers. So they could look at each of those patterns and then they can generalize that very quickly to make sure that everything like the, the, the overall kind of system works and we can kind of go after the bigger problems. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the other queries that I always used to challenge the team with was, can you do Srinagar to Kanyakumari? Can you okay. do a driving direction query from Srinagar to Kanyakumari and show me that the route actually makes sense? Mm -hmm. And if you haven't done that, I think we are getting there, right? <laughs> we have connected all the roads in India, right? So for a long time, we couldn't do it because we didn't have a road network that was drawn properly, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so, so the point is like, it required a lot of rigor and focus and getting into the grunt work and so on, getting users to input and so on. Uh, and that's how we built maps uh, in India. And, uh, and now we are like, whenever I go to India, it's, it's so funny because my two worlds come together. I, I call an Uber. I sit yeah. in the sit in the Uber and the <laughs> driver is using Google Maps. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, what is that, happening? Right. So that must feel so really good, really good. Like, it when, feels amazing. It, it just yeah. it just feels amazing. Like, you know, you kind of see your worlds collide a little bit, but you know, I feel proud of it. And it was mm -hmm. one of the hardest products that I built. Um, but uh, you know, it was it was an interesting journey. Yeah, I think Google Maps has been one of the most impactful. Yet, I don't think it it sees a lot of PR and, and talk about it, but it's one of the, the sort of the bedrocks of how we are sort of operating and with smartphones coming in, the location becomes more important. Uber is a great example built on top of maps. So I think it was a great infrastructure layer, which the world is, is using massively. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's great to, to hear how, how that came about. I'm curious to know. So, so whenever, whenever like I talk to investors or, or we in general uh, sort of think about our startups, we figure that India is a very unique market. That, that's always what founders want to claim because then that gives you an advantage to pitch and, and, and raise money. Right. But in your exam, in your sort of uh, this project of Google Maps, did you feel that India was uniquely different or, or difficult compared to Western markets for this problem? Yeah, so so that's an excellent that's an excellent question. So um, I would answer that in two parts. So the India was different in terms of the infrastructure that was available uh, for us to create the maps in the first place. Okay. So we didn't really have a good set of data that mm. we could basically um, license or acquire, uh, which basically gave us like, you know, the entire road network of a country or a city. And then we could get uh, lots of business data from other sources. I mean, the, 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 don't get me wrong. There were companies that were doing that, but they were not at the same quality and the same rigor that if I was in the US, I could go and buy, even the government actually has a really good data set as a starting point for mapping, right? So there were these infrastructural challenges. Uh, so that was that was something we had to think about. The second one was of course, the mobile phone adoption at that time, smartphone adoption at that time was still very early in India, right? So 
So even if you build that, like people were using mostly on desktops and, mm-hmm. and, and Google Maps really took off when, when, when smartphones became a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so, because that's where, I mean, it's kind of obvious after the fact, like it is a mobile product, right? Uh, because you're up and about and you're doing things and you're driving somewhere, you're not going to carry your desktop with you, right? Like it's, it's a mobile product, right? So, so I think those were some of the structural kind of things that, that we had to look at. And mm-hmm. I'm sure if you're a founder today or you're or a PM working in any company in India, you know, you always have to keep in mind that there are certain structural elements you just have to be aware of, whether it's regulated, by the way, regulatory aspects were very challenging for us in India, right? Yeah. Because yeah. mapping is such an important thing. So, you know, all that. Uh, so that's one part of the answer. The second part is in terms of user behavior, Mm-hmm. And user expectations, absolutely no delta between uh, an Indian user and a Western user. Why should there be? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, an Indian user, like, like the fundamental need for Google Maps is I want to go from point A to point B mm-hmm. and show me the best route to get there in the least amount of time, right? That's a human problem. It's not an India problem. It's not a US problem. It's a human problem, right? Mm-hmm. And And when you build products, you can always try to sort of I mean, there's localization where you can localize in different languages, which I mean, yeah. you guys do this at, at scale, right? You can, def- you, can lo- you, can lo- you can localize it and you should. But yeah. I believe personally that the core principle of a product, the core value prop, the core flow of a product, by and large, is mm-hmm. very similar across different geographies. And I think this is where the true scale can come in, right? So, so I think th- that part, I didn't see that much of a delta. And, and, and that's the reason why we couldn't build global products and, and everybody was able to use it, yeah. right? So that's, that's how I saw it. Yeah, so, yeah I, I, I agree. So as you mentioned, the core problem that you're solving with Google Maps is point A to point B. And it, so, so that's the hardest part. And the easier part is then putting the language above it and, and the UI yes. above it. That's the easier part. So if, if you can do the, the hard part, you already, already solved like 90% of the problem. And they'll figure that, that, out actually, the yeah. location and then and they'll go. So, so yeah, that's, a, that's in, a really good way. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in this problem statement, I think because the hard part was so technical in nature that you have to solve this, the, the, the UI or the language part was probably like the, the easier or the incremental part above it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, let, let's, let's use Uber as a quick example as well, just while we're on this topic, right? So, so the core flow at Uber, uh, not Uber Eats, but the ride sharing part of Uber is, you know, this is where from the very beginning, Travis was, uh, and the founding team was very clear that mm-hmm. you push a button and you get a ride, mm-hmm. right? So, so you had to, like Uber had to obsess over mm-hmm. that flow, right? Mm-hmm. If you open the app, you enter a destination, you press a button, cars mm-hmm. should show up, right? Like, like that has to work. Now you can, the technology in, a, in an Uber context, technology can only get you so far. It can have the mapping infrastructure, it can have the search infrastructure, it can have ETAs and all that. But ultimately, you have to make sure that that the drivers uh, are there, the riders are getting the app, the drivers are there, and and they are coming in a certain time and all that kind of stuff, right? So there's an operational element to it, which is very nuanced by region, right? Mm -hmm. So the India, so so you can have playbooks, which are saying that, okay, this is how we should go, but those playbooks actually change region by region. But the yeah. underlying technology platform is similar, right? This is not. This is equal to the Google Maps. We have to get data from different regions, but yeah. the core sort of platform was the same in Uber. The core fulfillment platform was the same, but then ultimately the operational element was what differentiated. So, so you kind of have to see where the where you can get scale because you have one sort of system, and then where you have to really nuance and customize and really focus on the local kind of uh, aspects, and that's how the whole product comes together. I think a lot, a lot of folks in the, in the chat would sort of agree with that. I think there are, so, so just if you take the example of Bangalore Airport, the way Ola and Uber yes. sort of solved it was very different and eventually they converged. Absolutely. Uh, but I think it, it was an interesting way to see like it's a small, probably a pod is looking at it within the two companies, but the way they think about it is very different because yeah. Uber is solving it at a, at a global scale. India is like, Ola is solving it at an Indian scale. So totally, I think totally. the way that pans out is different. Um, so Manik, one thing which I think all of us are very curious uh, in the audience is you've seen that entire journey of being like an individual product person, maybe an analyst, right up to being a head of product for a very large company. So what really changes as you, as you sort of grow up in this career, you get more responsibilities, you manage more people, what skills should one acquire to, to like tread that journey? Yeah. So. So I would break this down into um, like core product skills, right? And management skills, right? Mm-hmm. Because both are equally important in my opinion. 
And by the way, one of the mistakes that I have seen people make, and I was guilty of doing that myself and I learned somewhat the hard way, is um, as you grow up in an organization, uh, especially on the product side, hmm. everyone wants to be a manager, right? Hmm. Like everyone is like, oh, that's career progression for me, right? Like I want to be a manager and then I want to be the manager of one person and I want to be manager of five people. And all that is great, but please never forget that you are ultimately a product manager, hmm. right? So the, the, you're not a manager of product, you're a product mm-hmm. and you, you know, your product comes first, right? So, so this is where, where um, when I talk about product skills and, and management skills, you have to realize that you have to never forget that you, you kind of have to get, you have to be close to product, otherwise you will just not be successful, right? So, so in terms of the skills, product skills, I, I think the, the way I define this at a, at a, in a very pithy way is a core job of a product manager, no matter which level you are in the organization, is to make sure you're doing the right things and you're doing them right, mm-hmm. right? So both those have to be correct, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's not just you, your team, right? It, it's a team sport, right, in that sense. Um, and a lot of them are around, the, the thing that changes between, if I look at my own example, when I was at Google as an entry-level product manager and then I became the CPO of Uber, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the things are about scale, right? Like that's what changes between, the, between being a junior PM, ICPM to, to the CPO. Mm-hmm. But some of the things remain the same customer mm-hmm. empathy. You need to understand how your customers, whether you're working in an enterprise product or a consumer product, it doesn't matter. You need to understand, put yourself in the shoes of a customer and really understand what is the core problem that they are mm-hmm. trying to solve or your product is solving for them. And that, like I said, the scale kind of expands, but the core part of it always remains the same. That to me is like a super important skill to develop. The second is growth. And mm-hmm. I know you guys are growing like crazy uh, given, given all the investments you folks are making. And it's been amazing to watch Chat kind of go through that journey. But growth is really the oxygen for a company. If mm-hmm. your product is not growing, mm-hmm. what are you really doing? Like seriously, right? Like you, you've got to grow the product. Now you have to, there are, there are sustainable ways to grow and there are unsustainable ways to grow. But ultimately growth and, and making sure that the product is continue to grow in terms of users and usage, that's really the fuel. Like that, that's what get the company sort of moving, right? Yeah. Um, the third is um, communication. So communication skills for a PM, um, they change and, and there is a lot of demand on better and better communication skills as you scale up as a PM and you become a, like a senior PM and a manager, director and so on. Um, you, you have to figure out a way to communicate your ideas more succinctly and at the same time, uh, communicate them often, right? You're really the person who has a lot of you know, context in the air and you wanna make sure that you're communicating out that to your team. So, so coming up with systematic ways to improve mm-hmm. your communication cadence is an important investment to make. And a lot of people, unfortunately, don't do that because they think that, hey, I'm already doing enough, right? You're never doing enough when it comes to communication. You can mm-hmm. always communicate more, right? Mm-hmm. What's the worst that's going to happen? People are going to say you're communicating too much. Hey, that's great feedback. Awesome. I love it. At least you're reading what I'm saying, right? So, so, so you know, communication is important. And, and, and the last is like this attitude of doing whatever it takes, right? That That is something that you just have to like have in, in you as a product manager, whether you're an early product manager or, lit, or, or a late pro, or a senior product manager, you just kind of keep on moving the ball forward and, and doing that. So that's sort of on the core product skills, right? Mm-hmm. On the management skills, what changes is your ability to get things done via influence, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, most product teams um, are, are highly leveraged teams. So you have, you know, like for instance, one of the ratios that we talk about, we used to talk about that at Google and even at Uber is, you know, roughly one is to eight, one is to 10 kind of ratio. So one PM, 10 engineers, mm-hmm. you know, one PM, X number of designers, you know, all that. So th- these are not hard and fast tools. So I'm not advocating these, but like, you know, every company kind of figures out like what's the right sort of model. So as you can imagine, it's a very leveraged position. So how do you manage via influence and, and influence is not just with your team, it's across different stakeholders as you grow up in the organization. Um, like I said, the scale of the product, the scale of the stage of the product changes, Mm-hmm. Um, you also also start moving if your product is really successful, which I hope it is. You mm-hmm. also start moving from impact on the company to mm-hmm. impact on the industry, mm-hmm. right? And that's mm-hmm. actually a really interesting shift that happens. I, I've I've had that shift happen to me twice. We once at Google and once at Uber as well. Um, and and you know it it's kind of unnerving because because the decisions you make are no longer about just your product and you know your team and your company and your users it's about like okay how are we moving the industry forward right and and not only sometimes sometimes it can be construed as not moving it forward it can be construed as you're moving the industry backward right so so you have to sort of really understand some of those nuances and that's a little bit as you go more senior mm-hmm. and then of course there's process and organization and so on so 
So I think mm -hmm. overall, my summary here would be never forget as you're growing in your career, don't forget that you are ultimately a product person. Yeah. So please focus on the product. Yes, there's management as well, but focus on the product. Uh, and and as uh, on management, of course, get some coaching, get some help, you know, learn from the best people out there, build systematic ways to sort of really improve your influence and scale and so on. And that's how you will kind of have more fun along the way. I think this is this is a very good philosophy, which you mentioned that you're at the end manager of a product. So yes. I think that 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 grounding that you're the, the reason you have so many people to manage is because the, the, the company trusts you to solve problems, solve product problems, and therefore you have them. So, so, so that should be, it, it, it comes when you're very grounded in your approach that I, so if your fundamental reason of, of operating is to solve problems, you would eventually want to like have that philosophy that product comes first and this, I have a lot of folks that I can manage and, and solve the problems. And that is the, in the first place why I got those many people. Uh, to be managed under me so so i think that's a very powerful philosophy that don't don't lose your head as you sort of scale up yes. and stay grounded yeah that's, that's great so man manik there's one more interesting thing which is uh happening uh, in india like we are churning out unicorns uh, at a breakneck speed in india uh, we turned unicorn this year as well and yes congrats I think, thank you and and i think when you are in that that sort of phase where you're blitz scaling Essentially, the only thing that matters is growth. Are you capturing more market share? We like you would we would make trade-offs like if I want to grow, I'm willing to have like a suboptimal expensive infra, but I want to get my job done. You're in that mode where nothing else matters but growth. In that sort of a sort of war zone, how should a product person like change or tweak their way of operating? Yeah, you know, um, so firstly, that's a great problem to have, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I think sometimes. Sometimes people miss that context. Uh, people get very stressed, right? Mm -hmm. Like when things are like going at that kind of a pace and whatnot, they're like, are we doing the right thing? Why are we making all these decisions? We are accumulating all this technical debt and I don't know how are we ever gonna come out of it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are moving too fast. We should take a pause and those sort of things, things you know, reflect on it. All those are really valid concerns. I don't wanna trivialize any of them, mm -hmm. but ultimately if you're growing and you're growing really fast, that's mm -hmm. a good thing. We should recognize that and we should really be proud of that, right? I, I, it, it's, it's a little bit, you know, there are a lot of people who are hyper-organized. I am actually one of the people who is super, super organized about everything in life and so on. I yeah. also struggle with that, right? Which is sometimes when things are going too fast, I'm like, I'm losing control, hmm. right? Like, I, you know, I'm losing control in terms of, I don't know everything that's going on and why are people making these decisions and all that? Like, I want to be in the flow or whatnot. But you have to sort of take a step back and say, no, no, if it's growing and teams are doing well, I think that's a good thing. So that's that's sort of a meta point I wanted to make because you know people should understand that. Um, I think on the on the things around or, or some of the things that you mentioned as, as as things are growing, one is I I feel that the time to market and getting the product out in front of the customer, especially in a growth scenario, is the most critical objective function. So mm -hmm. what that means is, uh, by, de by design, what that means is that uh, you'll have to make some trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. One of the trade-offs that ends up getting made is, um, is, or at least it comes on the table for discussion, is are we going to accumulate technical debt? What mm -hmm. I mean by that is, are we going to put together a hacky solution mm -hmm. versus a perfect solution? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the perfect solution is going to take some time. But if you put a hacky solution and it starts scaling, then we have to kind of go and rip it out and put the perfect solution in there. And that's a hard hard discussion right yeah. i have through the years of my experience i have never almost come across a situation where the hacky solution was not the right answer mm -hmm. right in a high growth scenario so i would always advocate for the hacky solution but with a caveat which mm -hmm. is i would let the engineering team make that call right okay. because because that's a very important caveat yes <laughs> that's a very yes, important yes because because, because uh, the reason is, uh, you know, I mean, you can you can debate about this, and and you know, I have my own sort of conviction on this, but but I feel like the engineers should know that there is a reason, and you have to set the context for them. There is a reason why we are doing this, hmm. and we have to have an agreement between the product design, you know, executive team, engineering team, that look, at some point, this is going to blow up on our face. Everybody knows that, right? And we'll have to go fix it. Uh, so, so we should just make sure that if you're accumulating debt, like debt works like that, right? You take a loan yeah. and you have to repay at some point, right? So, so, so you have to have that agreement and I lead the engineering team should make that decision saying, okay, 
we get it, we understand the context. And by the way, if you have enough transparency in the company and all the engineers have context, like why are we doing this and this is growing and so on, the right decision will get made. Because mm -hmm. engineers also want to be part of a winning team. Engineers want to work on a product that's doing really well. Nobody wants to yeah. work on a product that's not doing well, right? Yeah. So, so, so I think the, the just be choiceful about the technical debt. Make sure that you are making those decisions. That's one thing I would say um, that I've learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. The second is you want to you want to also, especially in that phase, you don't want to draw hard product lines. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean by that is you want to kind of be a little bit loose in terms of your product exploration. And, and this may not this may not apply Ankush, to to like your core share chat app might be applying more to Modge and, and so on because you know you, you're 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 still scaling everything but but some of it is like still very early in terms of the product discovery and you don't really know how users will use your product right so mm -hmm. you don't want to like over over specify certain patterns and leave it a little bit loose and and maybe maybe focus on a few features and make sure that they land and don't try to have everything polished. Because mm -hmm. if you spend too much time on polish initially, you mm -hmm. realize that you took away time from the core feature. You'd mm -hmm. rather fix, fix the core features and your initial users will be more than happy to just love that feature and not yeah. and give you enough of a latitude to fix the polish later. Yeah. You know, typically companies would go through these massive lists of priorities and yeah. say, you know, we have to fix these 10 bugs and we have to fix this, you know, maybe spelling is too much, but like we have to fix this color here or whatever. All that is great, but that's not important right now. The important thing is, is your core product working, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, if you have one or two flows, are they working well? If it's a video, is it working well? Is it showing up? Like is, if, the, if the video is not even loading, you can have a pretty UI, yeah. who the hell cares, right? Yeah. So so I think the, the, that part is something which people don't understand. And, and they're like, no, 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 I, I'm not, I'm embarrassed by my product. Mm -hmm. You should not be embarrassed by your product. You should actually be embarrassed if your product is not growing, yeah. you know? So, so I think that's the other, fact, other thing. You should be a little embarrassed when you launch a product because if, if exactly. you're maybe you've done a, like you've taken too long. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, and, and I, know, I, I think, you know, a lot of folks say that, right? It's because, because this is the beauty of building technology products, right? Like you build a product, you put it out there, you have an instinct, you put it out there, you have listened to some customers and so on. Yeah. But ultimately your users will use the product the way they think it works for them, yeah. right? You can be kind of sitting in your sort of, you know, nice place or whatever and trying to figure this out, but like ultimately users are going to drive this. And, and if your product is growing and users are using it, means you're doing something right. And yeah. then you have enough time to fix the debt, fix the polish, you know, all of that later, right? Um, and the third point I'd make in this situation is uh, sort of related to the second point also, but I think it's worth emphasizing. Always focus on the core flow mm -hmm. or the core kind of, you know, value prop for your product mm -hmm. and make sure that nothing comes mm -hmm. in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Because if you start putting things in there, which create friction for the user, mm -hmm. which is the the core part of your flow, mm -hmm. I mean, people will just give up, like they won't use your product, right? So when you're growing, what happens sometimes is every team has ideas, right? Every team wants to like put stuff in it, like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have this idea, I wanna put this, I wanna put this, I, you know, every team is like, I'm working on this amazing feature, this has to go into this app, mm -hmm. because that's where things will show up and all that. So whoever is basically in charge of that kind of a uh, trade-off prioritization has to be very clear. Do not mess with the core, right? Mm -hmm. That this is the core, it's working. All the other things should just sort of feed into it so that we have this funnel and it's growing and it's all that. But the mm -hmm. core part is, in my opinion, is the most important. So those are some of the things that, you know, yeah. I mean, we can go on for, for for an hour on this, but like, those are some of the things that I feel- I think on, on the second point that you mentioned that uh, like focus on on what really matters, don't put too many things. There, there can be a list of features that you need to be yes. on parity with a competition or like there are multiple teams coming in. This actually reminds me of uh, when we were launching Modge, uh, essentially. So so we, so we TikTok got banned in India. Uh, we knew it was a large opportunity. We want to launch a short video app. And they were like, so we got to know at, at 8.30 in the night, 29th June, that this is happening. It's a massive opportunity. So we've been building shared chat for six years. We know short video is a is a massive content category uh, and we want to launch quickly. Uh, so we have a meeting within 20 minutes. There are a lot of ideas. Let's start with this. Let's put our camera. We've built these camera features that put it in. And I think so So the same voices in the group prevailed. And what we decided, see, peep, there were like 100 million daily active users using this product. All we need to ship is a feed of running videos. Make sure the app opens. When you swipe, you get to the next video. That's all we need. So the first version we shipped in 30 hours had just that, not even creation tools. Amazing. Because 95% of the people are just consumers. They're not creators. And you need to take advantage of this vacuum 
So you lift the video player from shared chat, make a new APK and just make sure you're swiping videos. And we did that in 30 hours and launched. So I think that reminds me that this is a very extreme example where we had to launch right. in like uh, in 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 matter of hours, not even days. Uh, so so I think that really so so the so the your pace of shipping out, getting the product in front of the consumer in a in a good enough state is way more important than yes. having it polished and, and and shiny and then probably by that you're already too late. If you're in a Absolutely. in a large industry, a lucrative industry, there there will be people who would be sort of going after it along with you. And they, if they don't care about the shininess and they launch faster, you already are losing users every single day. So I think that's a very powerful concept when you're blitz scaling, speed is the mode. That is what yeah. you need to optimize for and everything else gets yeah. solved uh, after that. Yeah, I, I, I would tweak your last statement just a little bit because I'm pedantic about this. It's not speed, it's velocity, right? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, a it's a speed in the right direction. Right. Mm -hmm. So, 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 but, but, but you're absolutely, I completely yeah. agree with you. I think that, and, and this is something which people, um, people are not trained to think like this, Ankush, mm -hmm. right? People are trained to be, you know, nobody wants to do suboptimal work, right? Like, like people feel value uh, and pride in terms of, you know, whatever work they bring, they want to do a good job and so on. And suddenly, if you know, you have this ethos, as you mentioned, which is, Hey, um, we're just going to, like do quick and dirty and get it out and all that, it, it's not consistent with a lot of people's thinking, right? And, and, and the people are like, no, no, let's wait. You know, will we be happy with this? You know, will I be able to tell my friends about it, right? Like they, they have all these sort of uh, constructs. So, so really getting everyone to focus on growth and saying, like, hey, we, we are in learning mode, we're gonna grow and we'll figure this out. And yes, we will park this technical deck, we'll park this polish a little bit later. I think mm -hmm. that's the, the, the model that it needs to be managed. Yeah. Uh, so, so Manik, uh, I think we uh, also, so th this one last question before we move to the audience, I think our audience has a lot of questions as well. Uh, and this is a, a typical question, which I think it was in, in trends on Twitter for a very long time. Uh, it was about what's a 10x engineer. And there were like so many opinions. Some people hated that term that <laughs> I don't, I don't want a 10x engineer. I'm fine with having a really grounded team working. So, so they had, they were different notions of how people look at a 10x engineer. My personal view is like everything, a lot of things in life, in world, there, there is a power law at play. There, there are people who create disproportionately higher impact than others. And therefore there's the concept of 10x engineer exists, but I think I would love to know that from your point of view, what is in your head, a 10x product manager, how is it different from a normal product manager? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question. I, I actually personally don't like this 10x thing myself, right? I, I think it's just a it's just a shorthand that people use. Um, but but the fundamental question is still valid. Like, how do you differentiate people who you know uh, are worth kind of betting on and oversaturating with resources and yeah. and turning the spotlight on them because they're just going to carry your company forward, right? Um, I think a few things have, uh, I've covered maybe a couple of things, but, but I'll emphasize them. So to me, the most fundamental way to assess and differentiate like really strong PMs from PMs who are average-ish, right? Is who really has a deep understanding and empathy with the customer, hmm. right? And you can actually test for that, hmm. right? Uh, and, and when I say test, not, not only in the interview, but like over time, you can test and evaluate that also. And the way you, the way I would think about this is, is on a, on a daily basis, right? Where, how does this, going back to my calendar example, right? How is this person spending their time, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's an enterprise product, are they actually talking to customers? Mm -hmm. Are they learning from the, are they going and talking to the customer success team? Are they mm -hmm. talking to the sales team and saying, Hey, what are the five things that you learned last week? Tell mm -hmm. me, how can I help? How can, how can I do better? How can we do better? Right. You know, you have that sort of a, that, that, that customer empathy that I really want to solve this problem for a customer, uh, whether it's a end user as on the consumer side or, or, or on the enterprise side. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, it's not just about like, hey, whatever customers say, I'm just going to build it. It's yeah. more about like true empathy in terms of, uh, of what really needs to get built using the power of technology and the infrastructure and everything that you have. So, mm -hmm. so that, that to me is like a really important consideration. Mm -hmm. The second is... Um, Intense curiosity. It's somewhat related to the to the voice to the voice of the customer, but intense curiosity. I mean, these are people who are generally curious about everything, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes can be a little bit too curious, but that's okay, right? Like, so they 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 are generally curious about everything. Like, they they are, they are very well read. They understand what's happening in the world, 
They understand the ecosystem trends. They understand economic data. They understand what you know the big guys are doing, the small people are doing, uh, the small com companies are doing, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And they just are generally curious about people and and how they make decisions. And they have this sort of learning mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can kind of close your eyes, all of you who's on the call, and kind of think about people you have met along the way. What mm -hmm. these intensely curious people? And you'll come up with one or two examples, and you'll be like, "Oh wow, they actually did really well." As you know, especially if they're product people, they did really well. Mm -hmm. It just happens that way, right? Intensely curious people make very good product people, right? I mean, that's just the the natural, the kind of part of the job, right? Um, and the third one is, um, I, I don't think that we talk about this enough, because uh, the common school of thought in product management is, "Oh, just focus on the customer and not worry about anything else." I actually have developed a little bit more nuanced perspective on this which is, of course, you should focus on the customer, but please do not ignore the competition, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there, you know, you read any product management blog and all that, everybody will say, yeah, yeah, ignore the competition. Yeah, yeah. I, I disagree. I completely disagree with that, right? I think you, you have, you know, behind the competition are also smart people, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's a people versus people kind of competition, right? It's not people versus like some, you know, third party competition, yeah. whatever, right? That's, so yeah. so So to me, understanding the strategic landscape changes, like mm. what's really happening. When you look at the big giant companies, you know, all the tech companies are more than a trillion dollar company. I mean, large companies are like almost trillion dollar plus companies, right? The Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Apples and so on and Microsoft. And there's a reason why they are like that, right? Mm. Because they have built these platforms, they have got these ecosystem plays and so on. And, and you need to understand in today's world, in, especially in a tech enabled world, you need to understand where the kind of strategic shifts are happening in the market as a PM, mm -hmm. because, and you can put that as an input. That's not the deciding factor. That's an mm -hmm. input into your thinking as a product manager and people who are able to navigate some of those shifts and kind of bet on them and bet the company on them, bet the product on them. They are the ones who really differentiate. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of PMs that I talk to, they're very focused, right? They're focused on the product and all that, all that is great but they don't have the understanding of the bigger picture, right? And, and in today's day and age, there is no excuse. Mm -hmm. You cannot like, you, you can go to Twitter, you can go LinkedIn, you can go any place, you can go join Clubhouse, whatever the case might be. There's so many amazing people who are, become, who are giving all this kind of information and insights and whatnot. So just learn from that, you know, subscribe to certain things and mm -hmm. you'll just develop a better perspective. So those are the three kind of buckets I would put, put like when I see, you know. The third one, the third one was, was interesting because this is the common sort of gyan that's out there, right? Like focus on the customers, not on the competition, which is great. Like you, you should focus on the customer. You have essentially the reason your company <clears throat> exists is because you're serving up a customer need. But the good part is there is an exactly similar company, which is solving the very same need also backed by smart people. Why would yep. you not want to learn from them? So Absolutely. it's not about copying or about imitating. And sometimes that could be a good strategy, like, but it should be, as you said, an input to your strategic thinking, like, right? and, and it should come like they've done this great. That's the input to me. Would it be a good idea for me as well? Because my, I know my problem statement. It, if it's a good idea, then you, sh it, you should not be shameful of copying. I think that's one thing that we've been saying in the company that use first principles. If it, f finally we are solving a user problem. But don't be ashamed of copying a really good idea because ideas can come from anywhere. And if, if you feel that an idea can solve your problem, you should just go and, and, and make it happen. But don't make right. it like a strategy. It is an input. Let that remain an input and you use your own head to figure out if, if it's worth your time to like prioritize and, and get it executed. So I think that's a very, yeah. very good nuance, which a lot of people miss when the 140 characters that focus on your yeah. customer, not the competition. It's not that simple. There's a, there's a nuance. It, it's not. It's not, and, and, and just to kind of echo that like a little bit like the, the I, what, what I also want to make sure people don't take away from this is, hey, stop focusing on the customer and yeah. only focus on the company. Don't do that. And that that's a huge failure case, right? Yeah. See, the other, the other thing that we all tend to do, and this is human nature and particularly affects product managers a lot, is when we look at a competitor and they've launched a feature, we actually overestimate how successful that feature yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. We overestimate, not underestimate, we overestimate. We're like, oh my God, like, oh, they launched this. Now, what am I going to do in life? And, right? and like, there's, a, like, there's a false sense of urgency that creeps in, which, which has exactly. to be avoided. Yes. Exactly, right? Like, like they launched this. You have your product. They launch this. I mean, they're smart people. You're, you're going after the same problem. But, yeah. you know, it's very likely that their 
feature is probably not getting as much traction as you think it is. It's a cool feature. That's great. Like, so, so kind of use that as an input and yeah. say, huh, how, why are they thinking about it that way? And, but here's my customer requirements. Actually, I'm just going to ignore it because it doesn't make any sense. They're being stupid. I'm just going to go down this path. And that's a perfectly fine outcome, right? So, so that, that balance is what sort of differentiates in my mind, like really strong PMs from yeah, like yeah. not no, so strong. I think PMs. it's a very real issue when, when, a, when your competition launches something, and especially it comes from like various teams because everyone is looking at them and and how we are doing ourselves. There's this sort sort of panicky or, or sense of urgency that comes in that we have to launch because they have launched. Yes. But do you really need to launch? Is that why? Is do you think that's the right thing to you for you to do in at this point at this context? Given what you are doing, they might be doing something very different. They might actually be doing things wrong. So it, it's not like yep. your competition is always right. So if you, if you have very strong first principles foundation in a company. I think all of this sort of competitive data actually helps you make better decisions, and it becomes totally. an input to to your strategy as well. So um, I think we are we are uh, we, should, we should take some audience questions now. Yeah, we should. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
you know, organize based on horizontal platform, uh, uh, horizontal platforms and kind of vertical customer teams, uh, have mission oriented teams with interdependencies work out with like a single owner or maybe a couple of owners, product and engineering and design and so on. Um, and then just go hard at that problem and, and just be nimble about evolving this. That's, that's, that's the, that's the messiness of, of the real world is, is kind of how things work out. Yeah, so, so let me answer the red flags question. So when I interview PMs, um, some of the things that stand out for me and I'm like, okay, I need to dig into this more. And by the way, keep in mind that interviews are also not a perfect way to hire. Like, like let's just please remember that. Like, yes, they are kind of the best way we have, but over time, you know, we have to keep on developing better interview cadence and so on. So it's not just one person's decision. Um, but I think the first thing I would say is one red flag for me is if the person is not being humble, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're coming in and saying, I did this, I did that, and I was the person who kind of drove this and all that stuff, and it wasn't really a team effort, especially as a PM, that's a huge red flag for me. There is not, you know, you, you could be an engineer and having that discussion with me, and I would actually completely believe you because mm -hmm. engineers build things, right? PMs basically get things built, right? So, so, so I just let's be clear on this, right? So, so to me, um, if a PM is coming in and saying, I did this and I led this strategy and I did, you know, it's like, okay, great, but like, Okay, was this a team effort and or did you do everything on your own, right? So, so, so I think that's one red flag for me. The second is if they come in knowing everything and they're not willing to sort of engage in a discussion and be challenged, uh, that's a huge red flag because uh, typically, yes, while, while I was saying I want PMs to have broad, <clears throat> broad context and so on, they can't know everything. And it's a learning mindset that you're looking for, right? So that's the second red flag. The third is um, if they have actually never failed, that's a problem for me. Right. And, you know, you can be very early on in your career and failure doesn't mean that you like had a catastrophic failure, but like, you know, you fail in, you did something, you took a risk, uh, could be in life, could be in something, whatever. And you thought it's going to work out. It didn't work out and you learn from it. I mean, I actually like that. And if you have never done that, I don't want you to come in and start failing for the first time on, in my company. Like that's kind of weird because then, then I'll be like managing you because you won't know how to recover from that failure. You know? So so I, I think I, I look for people who have had like interesting life experiences along the way. And if you haven't had one or if you are not able to talk about one, then eh, it's a little bit of a red flag for me. Um, and, and the final thing is just pure communication skills. Like if a PM can't communicate clearly and can't articulate and it's not an enjoyable conversation where we are like building on each other's ideas and so on, uh, that's something I dig into a little bit more. By the way, I'm very mindful of what I just said because I know that sometimes, you know, English may not be the first language for people. And I have interviewed a lot of people like that. It's the communication skills is not about you have perfect English. It's not that. Are you able to communicate your point of view? And are you able to relate with somebody who's having, you know, conversation, whether it's virtual or face to face um, and, and, and sort of build on each other's ideas? That's what I'm looking for. It's not about like you have to have perfect, like, you know, English or whichever language you interview in. Right. So. So those are three or four um, softer kind of patterns that I look at uh, outside of, of course, you know, your core, core PM skills, but those are the red flags for me. I think I have a little bit of a, I don't think it just applies to people who are, people who are early versus, uh, versus data. Um, ultimately, in my view, uh, it just comes down to, is your product working, right? Like, like if, if you are working on a product and, and your product is not growing and you have a certain set of metrics and you're not meeting those metrics, what are you doing? Like, like that, that's, it should be pretty objective, right? And so that's, that's, that's where even if you're early on in your career or not early on, if you're an early PM in a startup, that was a question, you will have some understanding together with your team, your engineers, your design, your, your, your executives, whatever, that, that we are going to achieve this particular milestone and this goal. And, and, and if you're not being able to do that, then you should reflect and see like, hey, there is something I could be doing better or somebody else could be doing better. But, but ultimately, it's the product. You live and die by your product, right? If your product is not doing well, it's your problem. If the product is doing well, by the way, it's the team that did it, not you. But if the product is not doing well, it's your problem, right? So, so you kind of have to like have that uh, number one. Number two, as you start growing up into an organization, there are these interesting teams that become these magnetic teams. Everybody in the company wants to work with them, right? And you want to be part of that team. You want to win, right? You want to be in, in a situation where people are like pinging you say, hey, I heard you're doing really interesting. Can I come and join your team, right? So, so there are all these really interesting teams that get formed. And, and as a PM, you want to be in that situation. And, and you should really look at 
how your team is structured. And this is not about you. It's about your team and your project. You know, how is it viewed within the company? Is it viewed as a successful team? Is it viewed as a team that's kind of just okay? Or is it viewed as a, as a low performing team? Because ultimately as a PM, you're responsible for the success of your entire team and you have to like step in and kind of address that. Um, those are some of the early signals that I would pick up outside of the formulaic kind of performance evaluation processes and all that typically companies have. But is your product winning and is your team winning, right? If those two things are there, I think you're doing a good job. Ritual. Uh, so we, we've had a lot of uh, silly rituals uh, which haven't contributed to growth, but we used to have a shared anthem, like a song we would play all the time when we hit a milestone and all of that. But I think one, if, if like I sort of think about one habit or culture which has contributed, uh, I think we, we've been uh, very obsessed with sort of sizing our bets or, or, or like having a very data back way of putting bets and and we get we get so obsessed so for example like both Moj and share chat we look at them like a marketplace right so if you want to predict that should we should we put more resources and try to increase the fashion content let's say that's our bet how much resources we put and what kind of gains do we get in time spent and retention and all of that now there is no easy way if you're doing it for the first time you have no benchmarks you can't really figure out how much gains you would get so we would go to the extent that we will do a negative experiment a quarter before where we'll take away 10% content and we'll see the drop. And that will give us a sense of the incremental 10%. If we in increase it by 10%, what kind of gain can we expect? So I think we have this obsession about if there is a cheap experiment that you can do to build more confidence on your bet, you better do it and build that confidence and then put that in your OKR. So I think that obsession with, with being very data backed and, and sort of building confidence on your bets a lot of the things that we do can actually be much better if we do it this way. There will definitely be a lot of bets which you can't do an A-B test on. These are like your gut-based calls or strategic calls. You can't really test your way into figuring out. So, so you have a lot of unpredictable bets already on your plate. You would want to have that minimized. So a lot of your bets should be very well baked out, very well understood with a, a quarter prior. Uh, when you said you're okay for the next quarter. So I think that's one obsession that has stayed stayed with the company. And I'm proud that that even at this scale, we're sort of obsessed about doing things this way. Uh, 